Yeah, this morning, defending girls sports, Erica Sanzi with Parents Defending Education, breaking down the battle over girls sports between parents and the White House. Earlier this month, the Biden administration proposed a Title IX rewrite that would make broad transgender sports bans illegal. Parents Defending Education Director of Outreach, Erica Sanzi, joining us this morning with more on this. Good morning. Welcome back to the National Desk. So this week, a coalition of 25 organizations representing nearly 400,000 members sent this letter to Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona concerned over this proposed Title IX rewrite. Tell us the ramifications of this and how it could impact student athletes across the country. Sure, so Title IX obviously is about more than just sports, but this letter does focus on the proposed changes, which would mean that people could participate in athletics based on their gender identity as opposed to their biological sex. And for obvious reasons, that has many of us concerned. Um, so we sent the letter and essentially the ramifications would be, I would say that there's three things. One is it's just a complete lack of fairness in this case for the girls and the female athletes um, because their chances of winning uh, obviously drop dramatically when they are forced to compete against biological males. It's also a safety issue and we've already seen in some contact sports that the girls are just at much greater risk for injury when they're forced to compete against, um, again, males, boys. And then lastly, um, there's a privacy issue here too, because when you can participate on the team, it also means that you can use all of the facilities. And that means that they've got a, a big issue around locker room usage, um, where girls are now forced to, you know, change. And not only that, that, that it's them changing into their uniforms or whatever, but it's also that the, that the males would then be allowed to access those rooms and change as well. So those are the three major ramifications that we see. And, and Erica, the concern is so great that 20 states bar biological males right now from competing in girls and women's athletics. So this proposal could be a direct contradiction of, of existing state laws. What could be the impact of this if this executive uh, order is passed. Yeah, so you can tell by the way that the Biden administration wrote this that it is it was written in a way that would void all of those bans in the 20 states because this Title IX rewrite basically says that you can't have blanket bans. And so um, it's by design that the Biden administration wrote it in a way that it would completely void um, the current bans in place in those 20 states. Now, certainly, I'm sure that the states would fight that, but there's no question that um, just on its face, the the Biden administration is looking to um, roll those bans back. And your organization analyzed the costs that would be necessary to accommodate transgender students to play in women's sports. What did you guys find out? Well, we have no way of knowing exactly how much it's going to cost, but the the Biden administration gave a number of 24.4 million over 10 years, and we just know that that's way too low because in order to accommodate again people being able to play sports and compete in athletics based on their gender identity, there would have to be a lot of changes made to these facilities. Um so that you could accommodate the transgender athletes and also protect the privacy of the female athletes. And we know that there's, um, in Loudoun County, Virginia right now, they're, they're trying to just retrofit two bathrooms in 18 of their high schools. And just to do it in two high schools, I'm sorry, it's two high schools, they are um, spending 11 million. There's 98,000 schools across the United States the United States that would have to probably do something in order to make this work. So that figure is absurdly low. Right, right. I want to ask you about these violent outbreaks and disruptions in classrooms that we're, that we're seeing across the country. There's been a huge rise of this since the pandemic, and there's these initiatives like restorative justice gaining momentum. What, what is that? What are some of the other discipline policies that, that you're seeing, and are they enough? Yeah, um, discipline was already a big concern before COVID, but since the kids have come back um, after the pandemic, there's just um, so much evidence from teachers, from parents, from students that there's more chaos and disruption than before. Um, restorative justice uh, is obvious. It's kind of like the new flavor of the month. And there are certainly times where it works. It sort of focuses on having the perpetrator understand and own what they've done and then make it right and that does work if somebody you know a student of mine one time took apart my stapler and if they put put it back together or they 
buy you a new one, like it's fixed. The problem is it doesn't really work when you're talking about um, threatening behavior and violent behavior and be behavior that puts students and staff at risk. So there's just a tension in schools right now between behavioral programs that seem to focus more on the person struggling with their behavior and ignore what's happening with everybody else in the classroom, which is that they're sitting there ready to learn and their learning is constantly disrupted because of the behavioral outbursts of other kids in the class. And so we're just seeing everybody. incredible frustration from teachers and parents. Yeah. Parents Defending Education Director of Outreach, Erica Sanzi. Thanks for joining us this morning here on the National Desk. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Jan.